this is just a silly question. Okay. You watch the Big Bang Theory, and what do you think of it? <laughs> yeah, I do watch the Big Bang Theory, and I, I'm, I've been privileged, but not as privileged as some of my colleagues. Um, they've invited me on the set of the Big Bang Theory, and my books are in, in, in Sheldon's apartment. Oh. I'm say. And you look on the wall, uh, which I do in every episode. <laughs> I now look for them. Um, and, but I have not yet been on the show, but I have been there when they've been taping it. It turns out the producers were fans of this at the Star Trek. I, I, I originally didn't like the program because I thought it stereotype, you know, scientists. But it's very clever and really, and the characters are actually very likable. So I think it's a wonderful program. I really enjoy it. It's the great thing about science, which you can call atheism if you wish, is you're willing to change your beliefs. You're not assuming the answers before you ask the question. You're not assuming you know what's divinely right just because you interpret a certain book to mean a certain thing, and someone else may interpret it to mean something else. You will agree there are different interpretations of every book, including the Bible and the Koran. And so you, to presume that you know divine truth before you've asked the universe is not sensible. I, really, I come here not to bury God, but to praise honesty, full disclosure, and skeptical empirical inquiry, which, alas, are bearing God. And, but that's the key thing I want to talk about. And, and so before I, since I believe in full disclosure, I thought I'd give some full disclosure, which is my biases. What really matters to me is the ethics of science, open questioning, the fact that there are no scientific authorities, that we believe in honesty, transparency, reliance on evidence, peer review, and testability. All of these, I believe, make the world a better place. And they do so specifically by bearing myth and superstition and dogma. And the, the point is that I, what my science is a human cultural activity. And in fact, if you read my writing, you'll see that I say the worth of science, in my opinion, is not from the technology. We tend to love its technology, which has made the world a happier, healthier place for most people. But it's the fact that like art and music and literature, it forces us to reassess our place in the cosmos. It, it, it opens our eyes to the world. And art and music and literature do that, but so does science. And there's no sense in which science reduces the value of art, music, and literature. As, 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 and in fact, the most famous example I know of in that regard is from Richard Feynman, I wrote a book about, who said that a rainbow isn't any less beautiful because you understand how it's caused, it's much more beautiful. When you understand the amazing things that are happening, in fact, it's much more exciting. We have seen people's morality, if you want to call it morality, change. Slavery might have been okay because you might have believed that certain groups were inferior or not human. Science has told us that's wrong. You might have believed, as almost all religions do, that women are chattel. Science has told us that's wrong. You might have believed that homosexuality is evil. But science has told us that all mammalian species have homosexuality. That's, there's nothing in unnatural or evil about it. So to, to have a morality without science is empty. I think what you said is correct. You found, you found a way to find an ethical theory that makes those two apparently inconsistent things consistent. Okay? Yeah, right. and, I think, and I've had a lot of discussions on stage and off stage with various theologians whose job is to do just that, to find ways to resolve apparent inconsistencies, to find ethical solutions that validate their belief. But that is what's wrong. Because the point of science and the reason it works is you don't just try and prove something you like to be true, you also try and prove it to be false. And that's what's really important. You don't just find yeah. a way to yeah. say the rainbows are caused by this or that. You actually try and see if your ideas are wrong and ask what's more plausible. And based on evidence and, and inquiry, what's more plausible. So what I find problematic is that the effort to find a rational excuse for something can work, but that doesn't make it right. One of the things that amazes me, and one of my favorite facts that's just true, is every time you take a breath, you're breathing in at least one atom from the dying breath of Julius Caesar when he said, et tu Brutus. In fact, every time you take a breath, you're you're breathing in atoms that were breathed out by almost everyone who ever lived. And that just seems ridiculous, but it's true. And we can estimate it using dimensional analysis. This estimate tells you there are a few hundred atoms of the dying breath of Julius Caesar that you're breathing in every time you breathe in. It's not magic. It's true.
And that, I mean, that's, I find that incredibly powerful because it means, you know, on my bad days, which are most days, when I'm working anyway, which is not very often lately, um, I, I just, I'm, I try and make myself feel better when I'm getting nowhere on a piece of paper by remembering that every time I breathe in, I'm breathing atoms that were breathed out by Albert Einstein when he put the last dot on the general theory of relativity. So Ken Ham would say, of course, the Earth is 6,000 years old. And I'd say, okay, here's how you know it is. And of course, he wouldn't understand what I'm about to say, but you will. <laughs> Richard Feynman used to, was asked, what's the most important quantity? If there's one important quantity that describes the universe, what is it? And he actually said something, but he was wrong. <laughs> here's it, here it is. <laughs> Here, there's one quantity that describes the universe. It was the discovery, more than anything else, by Edwin Hubble, that the universe is expanding. The universe is expanding, and he discovered, he got it wrong, but he discovered something called the Hubble constant. The rate of expansion of the universe, galaxies are moving away from us, and on average, those that are twice as far away are moving twice as fast, those that are three times as far away are moving three times as fast, and so on. And he, he measured, and we got it right now, the rate at which the universe is expanding. And the rate is given in terms of some units. 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. What does that mean? That means that a megaparsec is the average distance between galaxies, roughly a million light years. So the nearest large galaxy to our own is Andromeda, which is roughly two million light years away from us. And it's and actually a megaparsec is three million light years, but one and three are the same for the purpose of this talk. And what it says is, so the average galaxy that's a million light years away from us is moving away from us at 100 kilometers per second. The average galaxy that's 2 million light years away from us is moving 200 kilometers per second and so on. So it gives the rate at which the universe is expanding. Wonderful. But now let's think about what this number also tells us. It tells us every important characteristic of our universe. And really, the most important characteristic it tells us is the age of our universe. Because let's think about what this number is in terms of the dimensions. Kilometers are the dimensions of length. Seconds are the dimensions of time. And this is divided by length. So the, you, the dimensions of this are length over time divided by length. That means the dimensions of this are one over time. That means we could rewrite this that's one over time. And it, we, we could easily do it by writing what a megaparsec is in terms of kilometer. I was going to walk you through it, but I think I'm going to skip that part. It's a homework assignment. <laughs> it's really quite remarkable. Again, you're just writing down what a million light years. Light years, we could do it in our heads. A light year, the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second. A year, in case you don't know, this is about pi times 10 to the 7 seconds. 3 times 3 is 10. 10 to the 7th times 10 to the 10th is 10 to the 17th, 10 times 10 to the 17th, 10 to the 18th centimeters. Okay? And a kilometer we know is 10 to the 5th centimeters. So we can work this out, it's in our head if we wanted to, and you should be able to tonight. <laughs> but if you work that out, just the fact that it's 10 to the 18th, in fact the ratio there is roughly to 10 to the 18th, the amazing thing is, if you work this out, it is 1 over 10 to the 10th years. Just working out the dimensions. And that tells us that the Hubble constant determines for us the age of the universe. It is the one quantity that tells us what the characteristic age of the universe is. If the universe were 6,000 years old, the Hubble constant would be different. Now this sounds like magic. How can the Hubble constant, just some number, tell us the age of the universe? So the age of the universe is roughly 13 billion years. 10 to the 10th years is 10 billion years. So it's within a factor you know, of just better than, you know, better than a factor of two. We determine the age of the universe just by measuring the expansion rate. Is this magic? No, it's not. If you are traveling at 60 miles per hour and you are now 120 miles away from New York, how long have you been traveling? Probably eight hours. Probably. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> I drove in in New York yesterday on a bus, so I know that. But okay, 60 miles an hour, you're 120 miles away. All of you can pretty well say it's two hours, right? Two hours. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. We can say if the average, if everything started out together, and the average, all the galaxies are moving apart, say 100, let's say 100 kilometers per second. 
How long will it take to them to have gotten to a million light years away from us? Ten billion years. It's the same problem as, as, as thinking about the car. So it's not too surprising it works. It's a beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of a distant galaxy far, far away and long, long ago. And, uh, and there's a whole galaxy. It's about a billion light years away. We're looking at it as it looked a billion years ago. So, so many of those stars no longer exist. And here's an object that's just a, a, as bright as the whole center of the galaxy. You think it's a star that's near in our galaxy that just got caught in the picture frame. It's not. It's a star on the edge of that galaxy that has exploded. And exploding stars shine with the brightness of 10 billion stars. They're the brightest fireworks in the universe, supernovae. And they're remarkable, and I, I keep having asides, maybe I'll get to my point eventually, but um, the, the, um, this is something that, that, that I wrote a whole book about, and someone asked me yesterday why I wrote that book. Because it is the most poetic thing I know about the universe. Um, Richard wrote a great book called, our, uh, called, what's it called, Our Ancestors, what's it called? Ancestors' Tale, yes, I, I wanted to make sure I got that right. Uh, and, and I wrote a book that was a different Ancestors' Tale, it was called Adam. But the amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today, okay? <laughs> And, and anyway, of course, religion is outdated in the 21st century. Um, most religious people, to respond, it's, it's true that you may get many people saying they're religious, but none of them, uh, to, in the first world at least, in the developed world, to first approximation, actually believe the doctrines of their faith. They like to be religious. They want to believe, to use something from the X Files. They, they, they want to believe in believing. So that Catholics don't really believe. That when, they, that when a priest holds a wafer, it turns into the body of Christ. No one really believes that nonsense. I have, in the last week, for, for spent more time talking to Jewish atheists than, than I can count. Most of the Jews I know are atheists, and they say it's perfectly reasonable to be Jewish atheists because there's other aspects of the Jewish religion they like. So the point is that the doctrines of religion are outdated, and that's for good reason. They were created by Bronze Age or Iron Age peasants who didn't even know the Earth orbited the Sun. So, those, so the wisdom in those books is not wisdom at all. And people take the wisdom. In fact, we've actually learned something over the last 20 centuries, and, and science has taught us how the world works. Now, for science, the interesting thing as a scientist is that uh, God is completely irrelevant to science. Most scientists don't spend enough time thinking about God to even know if they're atheists, because they try and understand how the world works, and God never enters into it. It's just completely irrelevant. And in fact, the more we've learned about the natural world, the more we've learned that you don't need any divine intervention to explain anything. As far as morality is concerned and the person you want to be, which is really what, what I think is the heart of what, what religion... When religion provides many things for people, and we can't deny that. The question is, how can we take the things that people need, community, uh, support, hope... And, and use the real world to build those quantities. Because religion, if you base your beliefs and your actions on myths that are incorrect, you're ine inevitably going to take irrational actions. And so what we want to do is, is, is what science does, which is force people's beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around, and not assume the answers to questions before we even ask them, and use the rational world to build a global society, not an exclusionary society, but a global world where people can live together based on the reality that we're all humans sharing this planet and we need to work together to build a better place. A morality based on rationality and not outmoded religious beliefs.